got some really, really great lyrics to it. 557, let's all stand this evening in thanksgiving. Let us praise him. From the first bright light of morning to the last warm glow of dusk, every breath we take is sacred, for it is God's gift to us. back tonight. It looks like we've got quite a few that uh, are still catching up on the rest and from the traveling and everything, but uh, good to have you here with us. Uh, let me go through the announcements real quick. Um, again, thank you for all those that have purchased uh, Christmas poinsettias in honor and memory of those. And again, those are on the, uh, in the bulletin, uh, the thank yous for those, the acknowledgments to those. Um, also, uh, praise for the 154 Christmas shoe boxes that were sent out. And uh, this week, coming up Tuesday at 12 o'clock, the women have their prayer. Thursday, the men have theirs. Um, far as prayer requests go, um, got a uh, uh, text message just a little bit ago. Our uh, Melissa, our choir director from our home church, Larry Crawford. Uh, has gone on to be with the Lord. They had turned him into hospice a few days ago. So just to be praying for his family, if you would. Um, and then there are several that are still struggling with flu-like symptoms and uh, having gathered together, um, afraid of passing it around. So just be praying for those, if you would. Uh, continue to remember our students, our senior saints, our shut-ins, uh, all of those. Um, let's go ahead, open up in a word of prayer. And then we'll get into our, our lesson here tonight. Um, Michael, how about you open this up if you would, please? All right, turn in your Bible, if you would, 1 Samuel, and we are up to chapter 25 in verse number 1, and there are 44 verses in this chapter, and there's no way we would go through that uh, 
in one service, and I was trying to look for a logical place for us to kind of hold off or, or find a breaking point in that. So I think we're only going to go down through verse number 13 because the rest of it is dealing with the reconciliation and the, uh, the coming back together of that and the results of it. So let's, uh, let's all just stand out of reverence to God's word. Follow along with me as I read the first, teen, first 13 verses of chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. And then we'll, uh, we'll go back and take a look at these individually. Chapter 25, 1 Samuel, verse 1 says, And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was curlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men. And David said unto the young men, Get ye into Carmel, and go into Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace to be unto all that thou hast. Now I have heard that thou hast shears. Now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore let the young men find favor in thine eyes. For we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh into thy hand and to the servants to thy son David. And when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and given unto men whom I know not whence they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all these sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. And I pray that as we continue to go through this, that not only would you help us to understand how you guided the steps of David, a righteous man, but God, how you wish to guide our steps if we would just follow, faithfully follow you and, and trust, not into our own understanding, but your word and the guidance that your word offers. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us as we encounter foolish people in, in our daily lives and how we're to handle and, and approach them in the dealings that we have. And Lord, we just pray this in your precious son's name. Amen. And you may be seated. This whole chapter, with the exception of just a few verses, is dealing with David's encounter with an individual that is um, despicable. Uh, someone who... Um, is not responding and, and acting in a way that was acceptable in that day and should be acceptable in this day, but definitely not in a way that would please God and honor God in the situation it was. And then we're going to have, as we go through this passage, there's going to be a contrast between the husband and his wife. And we're going to see an unrighteous person and a righteous person and how they interact differently and how God can use both of those, but how he wants to be using a righteous person in, in dealing with, with circumstances and with other individuals. And not only that, but it gives us a great picture of David in how we are to allow God to bring vengeance when someone mistreats us, when someone doesn't treat us the way that we think they should or the way that even the Bible says they should. And to turn that over and allow God to have control over that situation. And we're going to see David respond or start to respond in the flesh 
and then God thankfully, graciously puts people in his path that kind of slow him down and speak wisdom to him and give him an opportunity to cool down and collect himself and think things through and do the right thing. And it's my prayer that as we go through life, when we get in those circumstances where things happen to us that aren't necessarily the way we'd want it, that God would, first of all, that we would, our default would be to do the right thing, the thing that's pleasing to God. But if we were to get into the flesh, that God in his long-suffering grace would put people in our path that could come along and guide us back to where we need so we don't have to have the, the judgment and the, uh, the corrective hand of God in our life uh, before or after we've messed up and, and done something that displeases him and dishonors him. So let's go back and take a look at these verses individually. First thing we want to look at is the request in verses 1 through 9. And the first part of that is the prophet in the request. Notice in verse number one, the beginning. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. So this verse covers the death of, of Samuel. If you'll remember, he was the spiritual leader of Israel. He served as both a prophet and a judge uh, to the people. Um, and he was the last person to serve as a judge as he ushered in and worked through the transition from God using judges to God using the kings uh, and the monarchy uh, to rule over Israel. And uh, he was someone that Samuel, you know, he had faith, he had courage, he helped move them into that transition place. He helped bring about the... Um, setting the stage that would become a unified monarchy, uh, a collaborative, uh, the North and the South becoming one, one nation. Um, and, and he was someone that was involved in the politics and the religion. And so he's someone that David looked up to. He mentored him from a young man. He had impact into his life. He's someone that David would go to and, and hear the words of God, the counsel of God, the wisdom of God. And so someone that as he's going into a, a difficult time in his life, you know, Samuel was someone, he was that, that, that earthly, if you want to say an earthly rock or an earthly uh, uh, person that he could go to for comfort, for guidance, for those kind of things. And, and with his death, it not only shook David, but I'm sure it shook all of Israel. And, and that's what we see here as we look at this. It says all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in the house. So you just see this, this nation coming together to mourn someone that had an impact in their life. And, you know, we, as we look at our history as a nation, we have had people that, that have positively and negatively impacted our nation. And, and for those people that we can look at and say, you know, what a godly character or someone that, that moved us in the direction towards God, we ought to rejoice in that. We ought to really thank God for those individuals. And, and that's exactly what he has when we look at this. And, and, and just the humbleness of him and, and the, the way that it was brought in, even just noticing that he was buried in his house. Uh, he's not someone that was, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Uh, he was someone that was grounded, someone that uh, was about serving other people and serving God and trying to help um, fil facilitate uh, bringing the people to God. And he's a direct contrast to Saul. Do you remember? Turn back with me to uh, chapter 15, I believe it was. When we were going through... Yeah, this is when Saul kind of got too big for his pants. I believe it's down. Yeah, look at verse number 12 of uh, 1 Samuel 15. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place and is gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. So here Saul is. He's getting ready. God's getting ready to say, you're not going to, your lineage is not going to be uh, the kings anymore. But he's already started building a place, a memorial for himself, so that when he passes away, 
He's got this shrine that says, hey, uh, look at me and remember me, and kind of like the Egyptians with the pyramids and those kind of things. It, it was that kind of a, an idea, and it's just a, you know, a public monument that bears to, to who he is. Uh, and, and it's completely different than what we see here with Samuel. So you have the prophet, but also notice the place in verse number one as we continue. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. So here we see David uh, as he learns of Samuel's death, as the nation comes together and mourns Samuel's death. He kind of goes off uh, back to this wilderness of Paran. And, and it's about 100 miles uh, south of the strongholds uh, of En Gedi in the wilderness that we looked at last time. It would have been a place where his men were hiding out. Um, and this, I believe, probably served dual purpose in him going there. First, when your heart's breaking, you want to kind of get a place to yourself and, and get your emotions and your mind and, and kind of come together with what's going on. But also, in this time when everybody was traveling and everybody was uh, mourning, it was a place where he could get separated from Saul and the danger that Saul possessed. Even though they had said, you know, and made that covenant, we know that Saul's not going to keep that and there's going to be that uh, friction coming about. So uh, David is kind of playing it safe by, by getting away from that as he goes through this. Now, what I want to look at as we go through this it's kind of, you know, every once in a while when we come to a passage that there is a marked difference between what the King James says and other translations, I like to highlight that so that we kind of see that, you know, there, there is those differences. And some of the translations, as they look at this passage, are going to say instead of David going to the wilderness of Paran, they're going to say that he goes back to man, all right? And uh, the ones that I know uh, that do that uh, off the top of my head or looking at it was uh, the New Living Translation. It says, then David moved down to the wilderness of Maon. And then uh, the New American Translation says, and David went down to the desert of Maon. So in both of those, they do something different than, than what the King James uh, and that text uh, gives us as we look at this. And the reason I believe that they do that is because if you'll remember, Back in verses 24 and 25 of chapter 23, Maon was one of the places that David had a fortress, kind of a hideout, a place that he would uh, go and hide. Verses 24 and 25 says, And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Man and in the plain of the south of Jishman. Uh, Saul also and his men went to seek him, and they told David, Wherefore he had come down to a rock and, bode in, and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. So it was a place that, that David would go to escape the persecution when Saul was trying to chase him and trying to kill him and everything. But when you look at the King James translation and you look at the other verses that are supported by the other translations, it lines up supporting the King James. Um, verse number two, And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and he had 3,000 uh, sheep, 3,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. So if you look at your map, if you've got one in the back of your Bible, you'll see the, the, uh, the Dead Sea, and about halfway down the said Dead Sea on the west side of that, you're going to have Mount Carmel, and then just a little bit to the left of that, you're going to have uh, um, Maon. And then if you were to go all the way down to the Arabian Peninsula, uh, about the middle of that, maybe a middle to the right of it, is where you're going to have the, the desert or the wilderness of Paon. And, and that's the area that, that uh, David was in. And you're going to see later on where it says he actually goes up to Maon, he goes up to Carmel, uh, and, and that's where he would have been if he was down in that area there. Uh, and so I believe it really lines up, and again, uh, the King James showing that uh, uh, it does a great job of doing that word-for-word -word translation and, and sticking to the uh, source texts that uh, uh, support that. 
And then going on in the, the, the people in verses 2 and 3. Two different people are contrasted in this passage, and we're going to look at the husband and the wife. So the man's whereabouts. Look at verse number 2. And there was a man in Maon. And again, that uh, Maon, it's a town that's given in the tribe of uh, Judah, uh, associated with the tribe when they dispersed the um, the land after the tribes went in and it was broken up. This is one of the areas that was given to the tribe of Judah. You can go to Joshua 15 and look at that. Uh, the exact location is not known, but as I said, it's to the uh, the west of the Dead Sea and a little bit west of the uh, Mount Carmel and, and that area in there. Um, so we have the, the man's whereabouts. We have the man's wealth. Look at verse number two as it continues. Whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. So this, this man was wealthy, rich by the standards of that day. This was someone that far exceeded average people. I mean, he would have been that, you know, we're always talking about the 1%. Uh, he would have been up in that category. Uh, this is someone that had all the things of the world. And, and so he had his possessions. And even though he was in Mahon, the, uh, the possessions were there in Carmel. And this would have been where they grazed them. This is would have been where the herds were. This would have been where they, they free ranged. And they would have been able to uh, have their shepherds out and making sure that the herds were taken care of. And it was a, a logical place for them to be. But, I mean, he was very wealthy. He had over 1,000 goats and over 3,000 uh, sheep, and, and so he had all of this wealth accumulated uh, as he was doing that. And then we see the man's work in verse number two as we continue. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Uh, so he had these herds, and they weren't for pleasure; they were for profit. And so you had the goats, and they would have produced milk, and they would have produced meat. And then you had the sheep, and they produced meat, and they produced wool. And all of this would have been things that he could have sold and used and, and accumulated and, and traded for other things and other products. And, and it says that this was the time of year that he was shearing his sheep. Uh, That's something that they would have done twice annually. Uh, they would have done it in the early spring and the fall. Uh, and I was looking at different sheep and different types of sheep. I'm not a, I've never had sheep. I don't know that much about sheep, uh, but I did look it up. Uh, and it said that, a, you know, how much they produce is based upon what kind of breed, what kind of food they have, um, the genetics, nutrition, the health of the animal, all of those kind of things. But it could go anywhere from two pounds of wool a year to 30 pounds of wool a year. I want the 30 pound one. Uh, but I mean, I think about, you know, twice a year, you're, you're taking all that uh, wool off and collecting that. And that's what they would have been doing. But while they're doing that, as they're trimming them and getting them clean, they're also looking at them and, and making sure the health of the animals. And is there any broken bones or, you know, what, what's the... They're, they're looking for the ones that need to be culled out and all the different things that they would do to, to make sure that they managed and took care of the herd uh, at that time. So it would have been a time that they had all of those together. The man's work. Then we see the man's wife. Look at verse number three. Uh, it says, In the name of uh, his wife, Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of beautiful countenance. So Nabal's wife, Abigail, it means my father is joy or my father's joy. Uh, and if, you know, us guys that have girls for, you know, that is our joy. It's, it's a blessing to have those uh, young girls running around in the house. And, and that's exactly what her name represented, would have, have shown. But notice how she's described. She's both pretty, she has good understanding, uh, or I mean a beautiful countenance, but she's also not only pretty, but she's pretty smart. It says that she has good understanding. And so this is an individual that, that had the, the looks, but also had the, the smarts as well. And, and someone that as people would, would interact with them, um, they, they could really um, uh, carry a conversation with them. And, and if you'll remember, David was, was described pretty much the same way. He was described not as pretty, but as handsome. But he was also described as wise. Um, matter of fact, the same Hebrew root word that is used here for good understanding 
is used in chapter 18 in verses 5 and verse 30 to describe David. 1 Samuel 18, 5, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. That same Hebrew word. 1 Samuel 18, 30, Then the princes of the Philistine went forth, and it came to pass that after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul. And so his name was much set by. So again, we see the wisdom of David. We see the, you know, he, we've talked about the, the looks of David. Well, we have the same thing with Abigail. We see her wisdom. We see her looks. And so they're going to have those common interests, those commonalities there uh, later on that we're going to see that God can use uh, in bringing that. Then we're going on as we see this contrast continue. We see the wicked, the man's wickedness in verse number three. Back and back up. I kind of skipped over it just so I could leapfrog over it and talk about the woman. But the man, he says, and now the name of the man was Nabal. And then jumping back over on the other side of the description of the women. Uh, but the man was curlish and evil in his doings. Okay, so the man's name, like many names in the Bible, it has a, a significance to it. Um, Nabal actually means, the, the Hebrew word that it's derived from, it means to be senseless and foolish. Now, if you take her, she's of good intellect, and he's senseless and foolish. And I know what you women are saying. Well, that describes every man. Uh, but it did describe Nabal. It, it really uh, meant him. And when you see that, it, it helps bring that contrast. Now, if you look at that, it says... After it talks about uh, Abigail, it says, but the man was curlish. All right. So after describing her as being, you know, smart and, and beautiful, it says, but he was not a smart man. And he was, that word curlish, it means hard, cruel, rough, severe, obstinate in the King James out of the uh, 36 times that it's used, the most times that it's used, it's stiff-necked. It's talking about that person that when he gets his mind made up and, and he doesn't want to hear anything else, it doesn't matter if you can show him, you can prove him, I don't want to hear it, we're going to do it this way. And that's the way he was, you know, in, in the mindset that he had. Uh, that evil in his doings, it means that not only was he stiff-necked and, and determined in what he was doing, but what, his attitudes and his actions were ungodly. And so it wasn't a, a good person. He wasn't a nice person. He wasn't the kind of person you wanted to be around. He was wealthy. That's about the only good thing you could say about him. And the rest of it was negative and the wickedness as you do that. Then we see the man's wondering. Look at verse number three, the last part of that. And he was of the house of Caleb. Now, when you see something like that, God doesn't just drop names for no reason. God's wanting to stir something in our mind and help us to, you know, remember who this individual is and where he's coming back. And if you'll remember, Caleb was one of the 12 spies that were sent by Moses into the promised land to scout out the, uh, the, the area there before Israel entered. And uh, of those 12 uh, spies, there was one spy to represent each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and Caleb rep represented Judah. Um, as those 12 spies went into the promised land, they saw the land that was flowing with milk and honey, but they also saw the size of the people. They saw the sizes of the defenses of the city. And so that when they came back and gave their report, you know, you had the 10 that were like, ah, we can't do it. They're too big. We look like little bitty people compared to them. And then you had Caleb and Joshua who said, God promised, let's go. And they had faith that God would work on that. Exodus 3.17, this is God speaking. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Persians and the Hivites and the Jebusites and unto the land flowing with milk and honey. So God had already promised that he was going to do those. So 
Caleb and Joshua, they, they saw, they could recognize what the truth was, but they didn't allow that to override what God had said. They took God at his word. They took God at his promises. And even when the people started murmuring out of fear and out of, uh, of worrying about that, Caleb says this, Numbers 13, 30, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it recognizing that, that God was the one that was going to help him to do that. So because of his faith, because of him standing on that and, and reaffirming that, God appointed him a, a special portion. And so when it talks about that he was of the house of Caleb, he's just trying to get us to remember, man, think about what his heritage was. How many of you have gathered for Thanksgiving here recently Stop to think about those that have gone on before you. Those godly individuals, hopefully in your family, that you can look back and say, man, they were just, uh, they, they set our church or they set our, our family on a foundation of, of going to church and believing in God and, and bringing us up under the, the word of God. If that's not a part of your your heritage, then hopefully in, in generations past, more people can look back and say, this was a person that did that. But here he's saying, man, this the, he's of the household of Caleb. 300 years ago, he was coming into the promised land. He's still on the farmland. He's still on the property that God gave him. But he's walked away from the faith that Caleb He's walked away from what he truly had to hold on to, the truth of God's word. And, and it shows how generational those truths are. Just because a grandparent, just because a parent, just because a sibling has it doesn't mean the next person's going to have it. All of that family has to be a part of that. So you see the wondering uh, when it comes to that. Going on to verses 4 through 9, we see the plea. The first part of that, the season of the plea, look at verse number 4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. Um, as I was trying to get my head around, you know, here David is, way down in the peninsula. Um, how is he hearing what was going on up here next to the Dead Sea? Um, CNN wasn't operating at that time. Fox News wasn't even operating at that time. So how was he hearing what was going on? My guess is, and what I picture in my head and what I'm trying to figure out, is if you'll remember when David left, David left with 600 men. How many of you ladies had to fix meals for people this past week? How many of you fixed meals for 600 people this past week? It's quite a bit just to make a meal for an extended family. But can you imagine trying to feed 600 people? And you a fugitive? So the way that I look at it is David is sending out individuals First of all, they're trying to make sure that Saul isn't coming with an army to try to kill him. But as in so many times, they are also foraging for food. They're looking for things that they can bring back to the camp to help feed everybody. And so they're out and, and, and going to friends and families and, and looking for people that will give them things. Now remember, they've been protecting people from the Philistines and from all these other uh, groups that were coming in and, and raiding and trying to, to kill and destroy and take the things of the, of the nation. And so David had a reputation and people looked up to him and, and held him in high esteem. So I'm sure there were people that were giving them handouts and giving them food. And we've already seen some of the, the priests that were killed because of that. But as he was sending out these spies, as he was sending out these foragers, as he was doing that, I'm sure all this information was going on. Hey, while we were up here, we saw so-and-so, and they were doing this. And, and so one of the reports come back that Nabal was there, and he was shearing his sheep. 
Then we see the salutation in the plea. Look at verses 5 and 6. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get ye up to the Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. So once David heard that Nabal was there and that Nabal was shearing his sheep, he said, man, that's a great opportunity for us to get some, some resources to help feed these 600 people. So he gets 10 guys to head up there, and he says, when you get to Nabal, when you find out where he is, I want you to go up to him, and I want you to greet him in my name. He's not going to know you probably, but he knows who I am. So I want you to, to, to say you're representing me and to let him know that I'm the one that sent you there. Uh, so greet him in my name, and then you're going you're gonna to have blessings there for him. Peace be unto thee, uh, both to thee and thine house. And all. So he's just reminding him that he's, he's, he's wanting the best for him. And he's trying to, to set the stage so that he looks at all that God has blessed him with. And he remembers that God is the giver of all good gifts and that he's acknowledging that. And the same thing that we have just got through celebrating Thanksgiving, just thanking God for all the wonderful things that he does. Not only that we celebrate for one day a year, but that we should do all the time. And so recognizing that and doing that. So as that and because of who David is and because Nabal is from the tribe of Judah. He's a tribesman. He's possibly a kinsman, a relative of Caleb. And so all of that coming together, David says, hey, this is somebody that we could ask for some help, for some, some handouts that it's not going to hurt them and it would help us in a big way. So make sure that you, uh, you, you give that plea to him. Then the safety in the plea. Look at verses 7 and 8. And now I have heard that thou hast shears. Uh, now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them. All the while they were in Carmel, ask thy young men and they will show thee. All right, so David and his men were very familiar with Nabal and his men. Those shepherds that were up there watching those flocks making sure that the herds were protected and moved to wherever the different food sources were. And again, remember, as David's band continued to grow, David was having to send out foragers to find food. And in doing that, at no time did David allow his men, ooh, there's one of those sheep, let's grab that. I'd love some mutton. They never took what they weren't offered or what they couldn't have. They never stole. They never fought with the other people over, well, this and that, you know, like back in the old uh, Western days, if it didn't have a brand on it, they would fight over whose it was, you know. That's the kind of thing. But he said none of that, and you can even ask your own people to verify what I'm saying, that the, he was so confident in the truth that he was saying that there was no nothing that had been done that was wrong. Then we see the sums in the plea in verse number eight, continuing. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh in thine hand unto thy servants to thy son David. So here again, remember Nabal is just extremely wealthy. And, and so David isn't like he's going to a poor person and asking for food. He's going to someone who's never going to miss, you know, what's being offered here. Some, some lamb that maybe has a broken leg or, or you know, whatever it is. He's saying, if, if you'll just, the ones that are in hand, the ones that, that are going to be cold, the ones that, that you can't, I mean, feed your people, but you're going to have more than you can have the, the excess. Let us have that. 
those kind of things is what he's talking about as he's looking this. So he, he, he's, he's saying, you know, to a prosperous man, you got plenty of sheep at a providential time. It's the time of shearing, the time that they would be doing those things. Everything was convenient. I mean, it was just a perfect time for him to be able to do that. And it's not like it was one of those instances in the Bible where God is having someone step out in faith to meet someone else's need. You all know the story of Elijah. Elijah and the widow woman. And how as the, the brooks dried up and things got dry and everybody was looking for food and, and she just had so much meal and so much oil to make her and that she finally got to the point where she says, I've only got one little meal I can make left. I'm going to get my little twigs, I'm going to make her cakes and then we're going to die of starvation. Elijah comes up with her and says, feed me first. And then you can feed yourself. And by the way, there'll be plenty of oil and there'll be plenty of food. That was faith. But here he had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats. It was out of that abundance that he was going to be responding to that. Then we see the silence in the plea. Look at verse number nine. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. I like this. It shows that David's men were obedient. They did exactly what they were told to do. They went, they delivered the message. They delivered it the way that David said to deliver it. And then they shut up. And they just waited patiently. They had done what David had told them to do. And they were going to wait and see what God did. And what Nabal did through, or what God did through Nabal. And uh, I, I love that it just shows the patient faith that we're supposed to have. I was thinking as Joy wrote that letter of thank you to us. You know, and, and how he spoke about uh, uh, Philippians 4. Was it 19? 419. Uh, and just that, you know, out of God's riches, he'll supply our needs. And he was just waiting on that. And that's the same thing that these guys were doing. That, you know, they would just, they would, they would stop and they would, okay, we're asking and, and we've made our need known. And we're just going to wait here and, and give an individual an opportunity to respond. The same thing. You have not because you ask not. But then you wait and you see who God's going to lay it on their heart to respond to those circumstances and those situations. So you see the silence in the plea and uh, as they continue. Then going on, verses 10 through 13, and we'll close out with this. We see the ref uh, refusal. And uh, again, in light of his wealth, in light of the protection that David and his men had provided for the, the shepherds and for the, the flocks and everything, you still see Nabal here. He just, just the, 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 the evilness of him, the, the hatred of him as he does this. Uh, so the saying in verse number 10, uh, the disowning and the saying. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? Now, don't read that and think he don't have a clue. He has a clue. Um, you have to remember that David is the most famous person to come out of Judah at that time. We're talking about the little shepherd boy that killed Goliath. Everybody knows who David is. They're singing songs about David. Saul's killed his thousands. David's killed his ten thousands. Um, 1 Samuel 18, 16. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. Everybody knew from the time that he killed Goliath to the way that Saul would send him out and he would push back the Philistines and, 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 and kick their tail and all the different things that he was doing. They were like, David, 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 David. And you know the people in Judah knew about David. 
And so for him to sit here and say, who is David, who is the son of Jesse, shows just how demeaning he is. It, it would be like someone who says they're a Washington's Redskins fan back in the 80s and 90s and not who know who Daryl Green is. If you know anything about Washington Redskins, you know who Daryl Green is, especially during those years. All right, and, and so, I mean, it was just, it's unfathomable that he doesn't know who he is uh, and, and who his family is and all of those kind of things. As I said, he's, he's a tribesman, but he's also possibly a kinsman uh, in that as well. Uh, so you see the, 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 the disowning in the saying, but you see the disparaging in the saying. Notice it says, there be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. So not only does he kind of ignore the notoriety of David, he wants to slander him as well. Man, that's the David that's uh, rising up against King Saul. And he's going to start all the vicious rumors and the backbiting and all the different things. He, he's going to start slandering and, and, and talking about, you know, he's no better than a, a slave trying to overthrow his master, uh, talking about David and, and King Saul there. Then we see the selfishness in verse number 11. Notice it, verse, shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh and I have killed and my shears and give it to the men whom I know not whence they be. I mean, in this verse, it's over and over. Seven different times you're going to see him use the word I or my. Again, just called up in his personal possessions, his personal power, his, 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 his. And it's easy for us to, to get in that way and forget sometimes that we're stewards of all of God's creation and be mindful of that. Paul taught and modeled stewardship, 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. 1 Timothy 6, 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which will some covet after. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Romans 2, 5, but after thy hardness and impotent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Acts 20, 35, I have showed you all things how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus also taught about covetousness, and he taught about being a good steward. Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not of the abundance of things which he possesses. Matthew 25, 43 and 46, uh, I was a stranger, and you took me not in, naked, and you clothed me not, sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? And then he said unto them, Verily, I say unto you, insomuch as you did not to the least of these, you did not to me. Um, again, reminding us that that as stewards of God's blessings, we ought to be looking for those that are less fortunate, fortunate than us, those that are, are needing help, those that are in circumstances that we have the, the means and the availability to be able to reach out and to help them uh, to do those things. So again and again in the Word of God, uh, we look at that. Then the last verses that I want to look at is verses 12 and 13, and that's the swordsman, all right? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all things, saying, And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. So it's easy for us to see David's reaction and to maybe even start nodding our head about David's reaction. Yeah, if he's going to do that to you, after all that you've done for him and you didn't take advantage of him and you protected him and you kept the uh, Philistines from coming and killing him and stealing his crops and, and you've done this and you've done that and you've all the things, then I'll go show him. And, and you know, you just have that anger burning in you. 
And that's exactly what David did. Well, I'll, you 400, put your swords on. And he puts his sword on. You 200, you stay here and make sure nobody comes and gets our stuff. And we'll go up there and we'll show him what. And, and they start running up and, and just that mindset of doing that. And even in his anger, he's being tactical, leaving some people to make sure they don't, they don't get everything else. But he's he's gone to um, uh, you know to, to make sure that uh, he, he he follows that. But in doing that, we have to stop and look at it from the Word of God. David had no scriptural authority or mandate to raise a hand against him. Matter of fact, the Word of God told him not to. Leviticus 19.18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Deuteronomy 32.35, To me belongeth vengeance. This is God speaking. And recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. God's answer when we in the flesh desire wrath is to follow the golden rule. As you would that men should do unto you, do ye also to them likewise. What you would expect or want someone to do if you made a mistake or, or if you were in a bad position, to love you, to forgive you, to show you kindness is what we ought to be doing to them. Um, and the other thing that God tells us to do when we're in that place where we have that desire for wrath is to kill them, but kill them with kindness. Romans 12, 19 through 21, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. But be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Proverbs 25, 21 and 22. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So uh, we're going to stop there. But as we go through this, we're going to see how... God is going to put people and circumstances in David's path to have him stop, to have him cool down, to have him think through what he's going to do. And it's a good reminder for us that God directs our steps. He just directs the steps of a righteous man. Um, and, and we should delight in his ways. We shouldn't allow... Um, the immediate gratification of wanting to reach out. I mean, I think many of us could see in our minds, we'd be wanting to be one of those 400. We want to probably be David leading the charge. Um, but we ought, to, we ought to want to be the David that is the one that's after God's own heart and really wants to trust and follow God when it comes to that. So I'm looking forward as we get on through the rest of this chapter, seeing how Abigail is going to play a part in that and then how God's vengeance is ultimately going to take effect and God's will will be accomplished through that. Uh, anything before we close out tonight? Just remember those that are still on the road and be praying for those uh, I encourage you to, to also be looking for opportunities that we can serve and minister, not only within the household of the faith here, but within our communities, within our, our people of influence, that we can share the love of Christ to those that are around us. And uh, I'm looking forward to more and more testimonies of what God is doing in hearts and lives as we get closer and closer to the return of Christ. So let's all stand. We'll close out in a word of prayer. Good to have our visitors with us back there. And make sure and say uh, welcome to them. And uh, if you guys need us, uh, give us a call this week. And Lord willing, we'll, uh, we'll be back on Wednesday, all right? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the guidance it gives us. Lord, just help us to become, come in love with your word. Help us to better um, understand it and in doing so better follow it in our own lives. And Lord, that it wouldn't be just stories of old and stories of David, but it would be 
principles and precepts that we could draw and use in our daily walk, in our daily circumstances, because every one of us is going to come in conflict with a, or come in contact with a, with a navel, someone who's aggravating, who's hard-headed, who's obstinate, who's mean, who's vindictive, all of those kind of things, who's selfish. Lord, help us to know how to rightfully walk before them so that it honors and pleases you. And Lord, we just uh, love you so much. Thank you and ask you to be with us as we depart. We pray this all in your precious son's name. Amen.